From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today during his weekly grain market segment, K-State's Dan O'Brien will provide a full update on local grain price basis levels at Kansas Elevators and the pricing opportunities those may or may not be offering to you producers now. Also today, the coach and members of the K-State horse judging team will talk about that team's outstanding showing at the two premier horse judging contests recently, winning the world championship at both events, the first college team to do so in the same year. Featured are K-State's James Latimer, along with team members Emily Meyer, Allie Leslie, and Emily Prue. And later, on Kansas Agricultural Weather, K-State's Mary Knapp, right here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test, fix, save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to Agriculture Today, our Friday edition. Thanks for tuning in, as always. To the grain markets we go, and providing his weekly commentary on the trading trends, Dan O'Brien, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension, along with us from his office in Colby, northwest Kansas. It could be generally said, Dan, that the grain markets, as we finish up another trading week, still looking for some kind of stimulus to the upside post-harvest now. What we want to do largely today is center on local basis levels around Kansas, and there are some interesting stories afoot out there. Let's begin with corn. Well, yes, you know, the downward trend we've seen in corn futures uh, starting towards the end of September when we were up to a little over four dollars down to about 368 and a half on yesterday's close for Dease corn. No doubt discouraging for a lot of of ag producers when they look at the future side and it really does bring up the question of what we're doing in local cash markets to try to pull grain into, into users' hands. It does look like for corn basis levels that were running relatively strong and just in, in some areas of the state really strong in comparison, I guess, to where we've been over the last several years. So kind of looking at the snapshot of 2015 to the present and where we're at, again, we look at the western part of the state. Again, the most narrow basis we've seen in that time frame generally for corn had been in 2015. And we're uh, we're running, again, in the, say, the Colby area, the Garden City area, just about as narrow, as strong as we've been in any year other than that. So that's, that's showing that there's some demand pull, uh, and if anything, a slight uptrend in some of those areas. Heading off, though, into uh, the central part of the state, the Salina basis for the last about two months or so has been the highest by far. <laughs> Well, by far in the grain market is by 10, 15 cents. <laughs> anyway, but it's been pretty good. One Salina location we're looking at, not too bad also, the highest in the last three years anyway, in the uh, South Central uh, location near, near Hutchison. Uh, Atchison, pretty much a similar story in, in the Northeast. Again, at pretty close to the narrowest, strongest basis that we've seen over that time frame. And then you get it down into southeast Kansas, and that's kind of similar, really, to what we've seen in Salina, in that we've got the strongest basis that we've seen in several years down in Columbus. So where does corn go in Columbus? Well, it heads off to livestock feeders off to the southeast of there, generally. So you've got some demand pull going on. It's, And I'm, I'm sure... Uh, that although on the future side, ag producers have have legitimate questions to ask about upcoming USDA reports and where numbers will fall out for a supply demand, et cetera, once we move down the line and actually get all the final info in. But at least as you look to the local side, you've got the need for uh, – for corn to get into users' hands, and uh, apparently the basis levels across the state are reflecting that demand. So, Dan, for our corn producers staying right with this topic for the moment, should they be thinking about parlaying this local strength in basis into their marketing plan for new crop? I would think so. I think we're heading towards December, uh, probably the next time frame that a person wonders about would be the switch from 
well, the switch between tax years. Do people have the incentive to hold grain past the first of the year to get into the next year and then sell? Well, that's something to consider. Uh, if, if we've had a fair amount of production in, in our in a number of the areas of the state, and I think we have generally. So uh, I think heading into December, I, I at least would be aware of what could happen in terms of basis moves. What the futures will do, we don't know, but probably the next big time frame where we could have a fair amount of volatility is out there on January the 10th with the next set of USDA reports. Now, your notes on the markets this week tell us that wheat basis isn't doing too shabby either of late. Yes. Wheat futures, well, whereas corn futures and soybean futures, the upfront contracts, have been moving downward at a 45-degree angle or worse in the last couple months, wheat has been pretty much sideways. And uh, so in terms of how our major commodities go, that's that's the winner. Uh, at least it's not falling off. But when you do look at, at basis levels, a very similar story, actually, between corn and wheat wheat basis. Again, out in the West, uh, not the narrowest basis we've seen since 2015, but close to it, if not tied to it. So, uh, again, not tremendous weakness, anyway, in, in basis, holding up decently for, again, Garden City and Colby uh, locations. But head off into the central third of the state, uh, between Salina and Hutchinson, uh, you've got either the strongest basis or the or just by a, a penny or two uh, the second strongest basis that we've seen again since at least 2015 and if you head to the eastern third of the state Topeka well look at Topeka area and the uh, Columbus Kansas area by far the strongest basis and again by far I guess I'm prone to hyperbole by we're, we're talking you know 10 15 cents so in terms of dollars that's that's a lot of dollars for the bushels that we're dealing with and it's interesting to look for the cause for that. You're thinking that maybe that wheat basis is being helped some by wheat feeding in lieu of corn? I would suspect that most in the southwest part of the state, you know, where, where we have a lot of feed, well, the western part of the state where we have more feedlots. And uh, when you look at the corn and soybean price ratios, for instance, in Garden City, you're looking at wheat at about three. Well, on yesterday's close, this cash market, the best price is offered three seventy two for for wheat, three sixty six for corn. So just about par with one another. And so people could be feeding wheat. I don't doubt in some areas, but we we just had corn harvest, and the, and in some areas a fairly successful corn harvest. When you get to western Kansas, I think we have had more success to the north, and uh, they've suffered from some dryness in a lot of areas to the south. So. Wheat feeding could be going on down there. So I can see that in that part of the state geographically. But when you're looking at the eastern third of Kansas and see the strong Topeka and Columbus basis, you know, the first place we look to would be to exports. We have had some decent hard red winter wheat export movement. It's, uh, again, not not gangbusters, but it's, well, for instance, we've got uh, 56% of the USDA's projection of 380 million bushels of, of hard red winter wheat, you know, shipments and sales together, that's 56% of the way to the USDA's projection of 380, and we're about 46% of the way through the marketing year. Generally, that's an, an okay pace. You know, you, they want to be a little bit ahead. So that's, that's indicating that, gosh, there's some export demand. It's not completely docile. So I, I, I guess the point being that just really interesting to see with, you know, with, okay export demand to try to put together the, I guess, the reasoning in the market as to why we're seeing such great basis bids, particularly in the East. And uh, we're not complaining about it, but there were, well, but the best thing to say is that there are economic supply demand factors that are driving those local elevators to bid up in that way. And if we were talking to those folks, they would say exactly what it is, <laughs> you know, because they live it. Right. But uh, all, all we can say is that, gosh, economic forces are out there giving us a pretty good wheat basis. And so that pretty good wheat basis combined with futures not falling off uh, for wheat as they are for others, uh, you know, it's kind of a positive story, actually, for the wheat market right now. Yeah which has been hard to come by in recent times in the wheat complex. And lastly, to local soybean price basis, more of a mixed bag here, you say, Dad. Yeah, again, the western third of the state, more sideways uh, in, in terms of where we've been of late. We did see a little bit of strength in the middle, latter part of this 
the calendar year 2019 was still a month or so to go, and a little bit of an uptick in the Colby area in the past few weeks, so that's positive. Uh, you do see some strength that come in in the Salina area in soybean basis, again, by 10, 15, 20 cents. So that's that was a positive. Uh, heading down to uh, the Hutchinson area, really kind of a weak, up and down, struggling basis for most of the of this year. But the last two or three weeks, you've seen kind of a 45 degree trend uh, to the strengthening side. So that's that's interesting to see. And that same type of pattern of of uh, recently seeing a little bit more strength in soybeans is also what you see in the well, the Topeka, Columbus area when you look at basis trends. So, uh, you know, we have had some improvement now in soybean exports out of the U.S. Uh, last week ending November the 14th, 62, 63 million bushels, and that's as strong as we've seen for a while. So some of that demand pull in the export side starting to express itself, apparently, in terms of what local elevators are, are feeling as, again, the, the pressure to secure supplies, uh, have them in hand, and then to to be able to uh, put those supplies in position and move on down the line to either crushers or to, uh, to into the export market. So kind of a good harbinger, I guess, of, of uh, what could come down the line for soybean exports and really the soybean market. Well, Dan's notes on the markets, as always, are comprehensive in covering these and many other market factors. And we'd invite you, producers, to have a look at those posted each Friday on the agmanager.info website. Well, Dan, we'll be talking again in two weeks following the Thanksgiving holiday break. Until then, many thanks and enjoy your holiday. Thanks, Eric. Take care. The weekly entry on the grain markets from Dan O'Brien, Grain Market Economist, K-State Research and Extension. Well, next up, we'll hail the achievement of a group of K-State animal science students who just accomplished what none who had gone before them ever had. We'll explain when we return in a moment here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today. It's our pleasure on this segment to tell you about an unprecedented feat by the horse judging team here at Kansas State University out of the Animal Sciences and Industry Department. They have been named world champions at the two leading horse judging competitions recently. We brought by their coach, James Latimer. He is an animal scientist at K-State. And three of the team members to tell about those experiences. We'll introduce them individually as we go along here. James, this is a big doing, though, isn't it, in the realm of horse judging? The first time this has been done by a collegiate team. Uh, yes, sir. So uh, the first time that a, uh, that a four-year university has won both the uh, American Paint Horse Association and American Core Horse Association World Shows uh, in a single year. So this is the first time that's occurred. And talk about the competitions themselves, the AQHA, American Quarter Horse Association competition. It's been around for several decades, right? Uh, Forty years. We, we judged the 40th contest uh, this year. And then the American Paint Horse Association. Is... Uh, that's a newer contest. It's four years old. But just to give some perspective here, especially with the AQHA, K-State has had success over the years in this competition. Yes, sir. We've had uh, multiple uh, world championships. Reserve World Championships. So this year, 2019 World Champion at the AQHA, we did it in 2017. And then uh, before that, it was uh, in 2010. And then we can keep going back from there. But here recently has had, had a lot of success. Explain a bit for those who aren't acquainted with 
the structure of horse judging at the collegiate level? What's involved? What classes? What competitions take place? Yeah, it, so it's it's very similar to a livestock contest, um, uh, where it's divided into uh, the evaluation and then the oral reason. So we'll spend the morning uh, evaluating all of our classes, and we have to be prepared to judge anywhere from ten to. 15 classes, um, but there was 12 classes at the AQHA uh, World Show. Four of those are halter, uh, just evaluating confirmation, and the others are performance. So things like Western Pleasure, Equitation, Working Cow Horse, um, all those types of performance classes. And so we'll spend all morning evaluating. And then they'll spend all afternoon in the reasons room working on their oral reasons. So they have two minutes to defend their placings to the official. And especially on the performance side, these young people really have to have a firm grasp on a great many things, don't they? Yes, it's it's a lot. So it's Western Pleasure, Hunter Hunter Saddle, Horsemanship, Equitation, Trail, Ranch Riding, Western Riding, Hunter Hack, Working Cow Horse, (laughs) Tie Down Roping, Heading. Um, am I missing something? Uh, I think that's about all. So, yeah. But suffice it to say, and we want to talk with three of the team members about this in just a second, extraordinary preparation is required to succeed at this level. Yeah, we we practice uh, oh, average to, you know, 10 to 12 hours a, a week. They would have started their year in the spring. Uh, we went to a spring contest in Oklahoma City that was associated with a American Corridor show. Uh, They were reserve champion team there. Then we came back in the fall. um, In September was the Paint Horse uh, won that contest. In October we went to the All-American Quarter Horse Congress in Columbus, Ohio. We were third there and then just finished at the quarters where we won that. So out of all our four contests, not out of the top three. Well, let's bring our young people in and get their perspectives on this accomplishment. We have two Emilys, Mike's side, Emily Meyer and Emily Prue, as well as Allie Leslie. Emily Meyer, what led you into having an interest in horse judging? So, actually, I come from a livestock background, and from that I grew an interest in judging and I always had a desire to compete so when I came to K-State I learned about the horse judging team and I thought that might be something I'd be interested in doing so just having that fire for competition and wanting to achieve more with a great group of young people is really what led me to joining the horse judging team. Allie same question. Um, So I actually started judging in junior high. Uh, My FFA advisor actually pushed me to do it. And before that, I had showed horses in 4-H, and my mom had grown up showing horses. And so it just kind of came to me. Judging was a second way, and my advisor really pushed us to do it. And Emily, Prue? I started horse judging about 11 years ago. I have always shown American Quarter horses growing up. But my 4-H advisor encouraged me to get into horse judging on a local level, and then that snowballed into coming here to K-State. A large reason of why I chose Kansas State was because of their successful horse judging team. Very well. Talk of your competition at both of these events. How intense was it? Oh, man, I there there's honestly no words to like describe how intense and competitive it truly is. Most of the time, a lot of these contests will be separated by like one or two points on the top end. So it's it's a close race every time. And uh, about the preparation, we visited with Coach Latimer about this just a second ago. But from your vantage point, uh, how much work went into this, Allie? We put in a lot of work outside of the contest. Like you said, we put in hours of work a week coming into practice between classes. We had morning practices, um, and then we just came in whenever we could to give reasons. And then during the contest, we got there a week before just to work out on the classes, and we were giving reasons till late at night, one night, and so a lot of practice and hard work went into it. And and Emily Prue, you have had, uh, among the three here, as much experience coming in as anybody. Was this as difficult or as challenging as you had anticipated? Um, Yes, at a collegiate level, it's very difficult. Um, You really have to step up your game, and you have to be creative in the reasons room. But we practice intensely so that we are ready for the contest, and we really know our stuff when we walk into that contest, and you're no longer scared of what might happen, but excited to show your abilities. Now, the three of you are speaking for your other team members who are watching us as we speak here. How excited are you for this achievement? I'm personally really proud of all of us. 
Um, we all went into it at the spring, and we were all hoping to come out with wins. I don't think any of us truly thought we could pull it off, and so being able to pull it off, I'm really proud of our team for it. How about you two, Emily's? Um, even though horse judging is an individual contest, we all had to work together outside of the contest and during practice, and we all had to share reasons terms and talk about classes. And just from us working together, we were able to give ourselves a competitive edge, and I think that makes our win even more special. I think what not only makes these two wins extremely special is just knowing that we were a group of young people coming from different states and different backgrounds, and we all came together and we grew a really close, tight-knit bond, and we honestly it just took ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And on that, I want to turn back to your coach, James. What made this group excel do you think that's pretty easy to answer uh, when you look back as a coach and you have great years and world championship years and then you have years that are the exact opposite of that Mm -hmm. and teams that don't get their name called and the difference between those two teams and those two years is work ethic dedication and a competitor spirit if you don't have all of those you're going to go at it haphazardly, and you're going to get haphazard results. And lastly, to the team members, what will this experience do for you as you eventually head out into the world and your intended pursuits? I think judging has just made me a much more confident person overall, just like knowing that you go into the contest and you have to mark your card and come up with a placing and then be able to defend your reasons and defend why you place the class that way will just make me a much more confident person and knowing that I can defend why I did it. Yeah. Allie? Uh, for me personally, I think it's the connections that it has built for me, just the people that I've met through judging and the things that I will continue to do because of judging, whether it's judging for each shows or breed shows when I get older. It's just the connections I've made and the opportunities it's given me. Emily? In the future, I would like to consider becoming an NRHA or a National Reigning Horse Association carded judge. Um, Among possibly judging open shows, 4-H shows, and things of that matter, judging really has just built connections for me. It's increased my confidence. It has helped me learn to manage my time and to manage stress. But on top of all that, it's allowed me to meet some of my best friends at this university, and I know that I can step forward with a strong support group. James, do want to bring in as well that you have a couple of assistants that were no small part of this. Yes, I have two assistant coaches. They're graduate students of mine that uh, helped tremendously, and I know I couldn't do it without them. So Clarissa Conrad, a graduate student of mine, my assistant coach, and then Rachel Sorensen, she's graduated um, and on to greener pastures, uh, but completed a master's here. And while she was doing that, she was my assistant coach. Well, a tip of the hat to those two as well. Congratulations to all of you and to your team members, whom we'll also acknowledge in just a moment. We appreciate the comments right here. Thank you. We've been speaking with the K-State Horse Judging Team coach, James Latimer, and team members Allie Leslie, Emily Prue, and Emily Meyer, who, along with Taylor Bastel, Chrissy Isle, Aaron LeCamp, and Lauren Greiner, made up the team that won not only one, but two world championships recently at the American Quarter Horse Association Championship, as well as the American Paint Horse Association Championship. Again, this is the first time that a single college team has won both of those championships in the same year. A tremendous accomplishment. And we'll return shortly with more on Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. And for you now, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
USDA Deputy Secretary Steve Sinsky said yesterday that it would be very unfortunate, in his words, for agriculture if House Speaker Nancy Pelosi delays that vote on the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement until next year. Pelosi was quoted by reporters yesterday adding some uncertainty to the possibility of a vote on USMCA before the end of this year. Pelosi was scheduled to meet with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer in her office yesterday yesterday to continue negotiations on some sticking points in the trade deal for Democrats. Agriculture as an industry has been among the most uh, staunch advocates for USMCA passage. 950 groups and businesses signing a letter back in May calling on Congress to ratify the deal. After Congress returned from its summer recess, farm lobbies and others held a rally to champion that trade deal. Now, earlier this week, the president of the AFL-CIO, Richard Trumka, met with House Democrats, pushing them to continue delaying the vote until further labor and enforcement provisions were made. That would be very unfortunate because we've been waiting a long time for this. In Sinsky's words, he went on to say, quoting again, farmers are looking for trade certainty. The American people are looking for trade certainty. And I think it just postpones locking in an improved trade agreement. Sinsky added that the trade agreement locks in the current duty-free access that most U.S. agricultural products have going into Mexico. The deal also makes some improvements with biotechnology agreements and with access to Canada, Sinsky pointed out. Agricultural groups over the summer pointed to food and agricultural exports to Canada and Mexico, growing from $9 billion in 1993 to nearly $40 billion in 2018 under NAFTA. The USMCA is a expected to boost U.S. agricultural exports by an additional $2.2 billion per year. Bloomberg is reporting this week that China's chief trade negotiator was indicating he was cautiously optimistic about reaching a phase one deal with the U.S. That's in spite of the warnings of the dangers of escalating the tariff war. Vice Premier Liu He commented in a speech in Beijing at midweek. He had invited his U.S. counterpart, Representative Lighthizer, to travel to China for talks this month, noting that the invitation hasn't yet been accepted. Now, yesterday, former U.S. Secretary Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said that America and China were, in his words, in the foothills of a Cold War and warned that the conflict could be worse than World War I if left unconstrained. Later in the day, former Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson also warned of the perils of decoupling the world's two largest economies. The latest potential hurdle came after the U.S. House voted 417 to 1 for legislation supporting Hong Kong protesters That has already been unanimously approved by the Senate, that measure. The president said earlier that he plans to sign that bill, according to Bloomberg. Now, Liu explained China's plans for reforming state enterprises opening up the financial sector and enforcing intellectual property rights are the core issues of U.S. demands for change in China's economic system. However, in a separate comment, he told one of the attendees that he was confused about U.S. demands, but was confident that the first phase of the agreement could be completed nevertheless. U.S. and Chinese trade negotiators will continue communicating closely and work toward a phase one deal. That's according to Ministry of Commerce spokesman person Zhao Feng at a briefing in Beijing yesterday, responding to questions including whether the two sides agreed on agricultural purchases and tariff removal, as well as a media report on the timetable for such a deal. Zhao said that the rumors related to all of that were not accurate. Well, leading wheat producers from all around Kansas recently gathered for an organizational meeting and the central topic of conversation, no surprise, the new winter wheat crop and how badly it needs moisture. Marsha Boswell has the details on this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marsha? Wheat is a resilient crop thanks in part to the cutting-edge genetics that modern varieties have. But even the hardiest of plants need a rain every now and then. At the November 19th meeting of the Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, board members from across the state reported on current crop conditions and expected acres in their areas. One theme through the meeting was the need for a refreshing drink for newly planted wheat. While subsoil moisture is adequate in many areas of the state, the topsoil is bone dry. 
Chris Tanner of Norton said that his area has seen no measurable precipitation since the third week of August. While the lack of moisture is a serious hurdle for newly planted and emerged wheat, it did make for a quick fall harvest for farmers. This is a stark contrast to last year when substantial rains led to delays in fall harvest, which meant that many expected acres of wheat were left unplanted. This year's efficient fall harvest means that wheat acres in central Kansas may be up in comparison to 2018, but board members in nearly all other areas of the state reported either a drop in acres of around 10 to 15 percent or acres left unchanged. Justin Knopp of Gypsum said that acres in his area may be increased, but farmers have run out of moisture to justify planting more acres. Knopp's area was hit particularly hard with rains and flooding last year, So to go from finding a fish in the middle of a wheat field, something that really happened to him after flooding had receded, to needing a rain to get next year's crop off the ground, highlights the extremes that farmers have to work through year after year to raise their crop. Michael Jordan of Beloit also reported that a sharp decrease in temperature toward the end of October meant extreme damage to his newly planted wheat. He said about two to three days after it emerged, temperatures plummeted to about four degrees Fahrenheit and killed those plants to the ground. I'm not sure if it will come back or not. Eric Sperber of Colby has heard a mixed bag of acre reports from his area. Sperber, an associate board member, has a unique perspective with the connections he has with his clients at Cornerstone Ag, the company he's the CEO of. These customers help him get the big picture of production in the area. While some producers are decreasing acres due to low grain prices, he reported that one producer will be increasing his planted acres by 25%. Sperber said he said that he found wheat is a really important part of his cropping rotation. After years of planting dryland corn on dryland corn, he recognized that he needs to add wheat back into his rotation to deal with weed pressure and a host of other agronomic reasons. Planting shouldn't just be based on the economics of the grain across the scale at this point. Wheat offers many other advantages in a modern farm operation. Sperber also reported that hard white wheat acres will be slightly higher than last year in the Colby region. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marsha. And in a moment, we'll find out what those moisture prospects might be for Kansas. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. For you now on Agriculture Today, the very latest on the Kansas agricultural weather scene. As we touch base once again with K-State Research and Extension climatologist Mary Knapp, who happens to be on the road today, but good enough to join us once more. Well, Mary, the story is moisture, the lack thereof. There was some rainfall and even some light snow here and there the past week, but modest amounts at most. Right. Probably the biggest news is they actually had measurable precipitation in western Kansas. It's been almost three weeks since there's been anything that has uh, been measurable. So that has been welcome. Unfortunately, there's a long way to go before we see any improvement in the situation out there. It should be noted that that moisture fell after the end of our monitoring period for the U.S. drought monitor. And not surprisingly, we've had some expansion of the abnormally dry conditions. The northern part of south central Kansas uh, filled in with abnormally dry, as did parts of um, northwestern Kansas. The other thing is there was expansion of both the moderate and severe drought, and the introduction of extreme 
extreme drought in those parts of southwest Kansas that have been um, in the severe drought category for going on uh, over a month now. That situation in southwest Kansas has been building up to this point for quite some time. And it did cool off again the latter half of this week. In advance of that, pretty warm conditions, Mary. We had a seesaw of temperatures, so we had both the very warm and the very cold, and at this point it looks like it's going to come out pretty close to even for the week. If we look at the period through Tuesday, we were actually colder than normal for most of the state, the exception being the northwest corner, which is not usually the case. Looking ahead to the coming days then, there is moisture in the forecast, you say, through Thanksgiving Day and maybe a bit beyond, but how much are we talking about here in amounts? Well, when we look at the quantitative precip forecast, um, if we look at the week period going through next Thursday evening, the amounts are on the fairly light side, the southwest corner of the state may see as much as a tenth of an inch. Um, They're in the uh, hundredth to a tenth of an inch band. Um, There's a band from northwest going across central Kansas and down into southeast that may see um, a quarter to a half an inch of um, moisture. What we're really seeing in this pattern is to our north, um, fairly light amounts of precipitation, To our west, along the Rockies, um, heavy amounts, and that carries down into southwest U.S., um, particularly Arizona and New Mexico, where they may see as much as two inches of of moisture. The other band of uh, moisture goes from east Texas across Arkansas, southeast Missouri, and up the Ohio River Valley, And down to the Appalachians, where they may see as much as two inches of moisture. So we're kind of in the calm spot between the two vigorous systems, one to our west and one to our east. Problems for anybody that has travel plans, if you have airline connections that originate on the west coast or the east coast, you may run into some difficulties If you're driving through the central northern plains, less problematic, at least at this time. We are watching the fact that there is a very ample supply of moisture from the Pacific on the southern edge. Uh, The question will be where and when does that kick northward? And that is unknown at this time, of course. So, Yeah, at this point, it's kind of hard to say which way it will go, and that would be anybody um, who has travel plans for this holiday weekend or is looking at any activities that are impacted by weather, you really need to keep abreast of the updates because these could change very quickly. And a brief glance to the extended outlook beyond Thanksgiving Day and into the first week or two of December. What's expected there? Well, when we look at the Climate Prediction Center's outlook for the 6 to 10 day period, which covers November 27th through December 1st, they have a very strong probability of above normal moisture in the desert southwest, fairly strong across most of Kansas, and in fact, over most of the U.S., the Florida Panhandle and the extreme Pacific Northwest may be on the dry side, but For the rest of the country, it it has a good pattern for wetter than normal. On the temperature side, we're still going to be in a slightly warmer than normal pattern. The cold air is building in the Pacific Northwest, extending to the uh, about the front range of the Rockies. If we push out a little bit further and look at the 8 to 14 day outlook, which carries us through the 5th of December, precipitation probabilities are still favored to be above normal, keeping in mind that normal for us at this time of the year isn't a whole lot. On the temperature side, that warmer than normal pocket is pulled down to Texas and along the deep south, 
with the above normal expanding out of that Pacific Northwest across the northern plains and into Kansas. Oklahoma is kind of the boundary line between the warmer and cooler than normal conditions. All right. Well, as you said, Mary, if folks take due care, it sounds like travel within the state of Kansas during the Thanksgiving holiday will be fairly manageable. But do check if you are traveling further outward and uh, see what the weather conditions are likely to be and how those might influence your travel plans. Well, and I would remind people as well that it doesn't take a lot of um, moisture if it's right at that freezing level to create problems. So pay attention to those changing road conditions because we will be borderline on the temperatures as far as remember normal at this time of the year is below freezing for nighttime lows. So keep in mind that we could have some icing with that. We'll talk again in two weeks. Mary, many thanks to you. Thanks, Eric. Mary Knapp. Along with us, climatologist, K-State Research and Extension. And thanks to you as well for being along with us. Please rejoin us on Monday. Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good weekend for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.